invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 5 just in just a moment. Appreciate you all being here tonight. It's getting to be that time of year where the temperature will be rising. I had to do a double take. I was making dinner the other night. The local broadcast came on and says, yes, and our first triple digit day is on the horizon. I said, no, it ain't. It's too early. And sure enough, I can't control that. <laughs> it's just that time of year. And when Alan Greeley did his meeting here, it reminded me that if an Arizonan is telling you you get used to it, they're lying. There's no one ever gets used to it. We just tolerate it. Because then you get Decembers where it's 70 degrees and no snow and no ice. And that we're always thankful for. It comes with the territory. Uh, it's just that time of year as, as the seasons change and the ebbs and flows, you know, we're already in quarter two of the year and sure enough, quarter three will be coming around the corner. And that kind of relates to what we're going to be talking tonight is tonight we're going to be talking about the great need for teachers in the church today. You know, I'll admit, and I'm preaching at the beginning of this quarter because the next quarter is coming, and our deacons and will always need teachers. But tonight we want to be looking at how teaching actually should be a natural benchmark in our Christian life when it comes to pressing on maturity. And we'll see at the end of this lesson, this does not mean that all of us are going to be auditorium class teachers or teaching Sunday school, but all of us to the capacity and ability we have ought to be making the attempt in some way, shape, or form to be teaching. And so to that end, let's just start talking about how teaching is a mark of maturity. You know, we, we understand from the scriptures that we are to be growing in our knowledge and our application of the word of God. You know, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, if you just want to bookmark Hebrews chapter 5, one of the last things Peter wrote to us, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, was that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. There's no end point to our growing in our understanding of God's word, right? And there's no end point to our growing in application of God's word, right? That's what James says in James chapter 1, verses 21 through 22, that we are to receive the implanted word with meekness, that we, by it we may grow in respect to salvation and not to become ineffectual hearers, but effectual doers of the word. So every Christian should be taking in the, the scripture in order to grow in their understanding and how they live by the scriptures. But part of that growth and application is the ability to communicate the word of God to somebody else. In fact, Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 says that the ability to speak truth to one another is how we grow to maturity. So if we want to keep growing in our Christian life and growing in maturity, we communicating the word of God and teaching it is non-negotiable. We have to be engaged in this. Look over in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. The Legacy Standard Bible renders it this way. It says, So that we are to no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. It's the ability to communicate the word of God to somebody else really indicates, I won't say mastery because we spend our entire lives continuing to study the word of God, but it indicates a firm a grasp of the concepts of what's, what's in the word of God. You know, if you've never seen these videos, uh, I forget what channel does not on YouTube, but they take... They'll take certain concepts and they'll explain it on five levels. And the best level I love watching is they'll take an astrophysicist, you know, get all the doctorates and everything, and they'll have them explain the theory of relativity to a third grader. 
And most of the time they can do it, right? That shows a, a, a thorough understanding of their, their subject field if they can communicate those big concepts right to a child who's in the third grade. And the ability to communicate that is a marker of a maturity in the subject and an understanding of the subject. And it's no wonder then why God would have us to have this communicating of, of his will, of the word of God, to each other as not only the marker of spiritual maturity, but the means by which we grow to spiritual maturity. I will tell you this from personal experience. Yes, you can learn a lot sitting in a class, you can learn a lot listening and studying sermons and, and studying the books, but you learn far more when you teach. Teaching is one of the greatest experiences you can have as, as a Christian. It's also the most humbling. It's both at the same time. <laughs> because you, you might think you have a really good illustration or a really good point and you're communicating the class and then you look out and everyone's just kind of glossed over and just they're not getting it right it challenges you to figure out different ways of communicating different ways of explaining what do you do with how do you teach the word of god to somebody who maybe doesn't handle uh doesn't really understand uh figures of speech how do you explain uh the ag the agricultural parables to kids or an uh, audience who's never seen a farm in their life it's it challenges you to really think through a text in order to clearly communicate it to different audiences. And that's an experience you don't get unless you're involved in, in communicating the Word of God in some way, shape, or form. So it's that marker of maturity, right? And as our source text, we haven't read it ton yet tonight because I saved it for this, the Bible is very clear that not attempting to teach is seen as stunted growth in our Christianity. Back in the book of Hebrews, where I said to be open there, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. The Hebrew Christians were dealing with a lot of issues, a lot of persecution, a lot of pushback. And the, the book of Hebrews is one giant encouragement and admonishment for them to remain faithful to Christ. And in, in the midst of that, the, the writer wants to talk about some more meatier things. But he can't because of their spiritual immaturity. And one of the markers of that, he says in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. In almost every, every area of our lives that we can think about, there comes a point where we need to start passing on the knowledge that we have acquired. Even if it's just in the practicalities of life. We don't call it teaching, but we, there's another word for it. We call it parenting, right? What is your goal as a parent? So I've been informed. It's to impart all your information, all your practical life lessons in order to raise another person in order to be a functional, responsible human being, right? That's teaching. In construction or a trade, oftentimes you get to a certain rank where they start giving you an apprentice, or you have to start teaching them how to do the job. In fact, in most martial arts, when you get to a high enough level, you get some sort of honorific that includes some sort of teaching title, because the expectation is you're now going to help educate the lower ranks. And same thing in Christianity. You get to a certain level of maturity, the expectation is you're going to help bring other Christians into maturity. And so there's always a pressing need for teachers in the church. There will always be a pressing need. We'll never get away from the pressing need. And something that occurred to me as I was studying in preparation for this lesson, I know I'm preaching a lesson right now, but if you look at the book of Acts, more was accomplished through teaching than preaching. You say, well, hold, hold up. 3,000 people were baptized after one sermon. Yes, but that was the exception, not the rule. In fact, what the Bible says, where, where Paul had his periods of most productive ministry, 
were areas that he could teach house to house uninterrupted. Look in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. The, the two places where Paul had the most uninterrupted time teaching was at Corinth and Ephesus. He was able to spend over a year at Corinth and over two years in Ephesus. And I want us to know what the, what the text says there. In chapter 13, verse 1 of the book of Acts. Now there were Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers... Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. What I also find interesting in verse 1 here, and this is him in Antioch, the Bible does not say, and there were many prophets and preachers at the church at Antioch. No, there were many prophets and teachers. Secondly, Saul, he... He's the chief missionary, right? He's one of the great apostles. He's one of the great preachers we think of in the New Testament. Saul is not the only one doing the teaching. He's in rotation with a whole bunch of other men. Again, most of these men we don't know much about. We know about Barnabas. But there's Barnabas, Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who was a childhood friend of Herod. Let that sink in. And Saul. You had five teachers teaching at Antioch. Yes, I admit, there, there was the sermons each week. But these men were busy teaching the brethren day to day. In Acts chapter 18, in verse 11, here Paul is at Corinth. Acts 18, verse 11, and here's what the Spirit says here. He says, and he stayed there, referring to Paul, a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Yes, Paul was preaching. But over and over again, we see the text emphasizing that Paul was teaching for uninterrupted periods of time. And also in Acts 19, looking here at verses 9 and 10, Speaking about when the synagogue would no longer listen to him, it says in verse 9, but when some were becoming hardened and were not believing, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he left them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. I omit, verse 9 does not say teaching, but it says reasoning daily in a school, right? That's probably the location they were renting. But in, in, in the Greek culture at this time, this is how philosophy schools would work. Normally from early in the morning to about noon before it got too hot, they would be engaged. And the way the Greeks engaged in teaching was kind of similar to the rabbis. That the teacher would sit there and students would ask questions. And the teacher would respond and give answers and maybe give give questions and response to their questions to get them to think through some things. My point is this, that when you look at the periods of very fruitful ministry of the life of the Apostle Paul, it's periods that he had uninterrupted time to teach the people publicly and house to house, as he says in Acts 20, uh, about to the elders at the church at Ephesus. And one little practical consideration before we consider the areas in which we always need teachers. In a sermon, I have normally one overarching point that I'm trying to get across. And I'm hoping and praying that point can be applicable to as many people as possible in the room. But the problem is, sometimes what I'm preaching on isn't always applicable to everyone in the room. Think about a lesson on marriage, for example. That's a topic that needs a lot of preaching and teaching on. And it's good for non-married people and young people to hear lessons on that, but there's not immediate application for our lesson on marriage for our young people that's over here, or for me who's necessarily single about a marriage a husband-wife relationship. There's application of preparing for that. I'll grant you that, but if that's my topic for the day, that's my topic for the day. And yet when I'm teaching, 
like in the community Bible study, sometimes we have only one person show up. And I'll ask them, well, what are your questions? And we'll completely divert and we'll go to where we need to talk about, where we need to teach. I can make it tailored and customized to that person. In a small group setting, somebody might have an issue that comes up and you spend the rest of the setting dealing with that issue, helping them through their hurt or their trial. That's teaching. It can fit the need in the moment. Not saying that preaching can't do that, but this the reality is teaching, I have a greater opportunity to make it the message custom fit for that person's needs. There's more flexibility there. Now I want us to think about all the areas in a local church in which teachers are needed. I mean, we, we have children, of course, that's the one that always comes up. That is important, right? And I'm going to be just blunt about this. We'd have more young people staying in the church as a whole if we had more mature Christians be enthusiastic and involved in the teaching program of a local church. That's not to shame anyone here. I think we do pretty good at that. We need to improve it, but I think we do pretty good at that. But many congregations have lost their young people because no one cared about the education of the youth of that congregation. And that's twofold. Parents have responsibility, and the local church has responsibility too, as a supplement to the parents. But they go hand in hand there. You have new converts. You know, I kinda, I've, I've made it a personal kind of rule of mine. If I baptize two or three people, I can't really do any more personal work after that because now I'm getting, making sure these new converts get grounded in the faith so they don't, fall, they can, I'm doing as much as possible to make sure they don't fall away, right? I want to get their Christianity online, as it were, to get their Christianity going. I want to make sure they get grounded in the faith. New converts always need teachers. There's a need for women's classes, uh, specific needs and areas and subjects and topics for women. On the same token, there's men need specific classes on that. Consider the trends in our culture, our young men need classes on what does it mean to be a man according to God? What does it mean to be a husband and a father and, and a good son and a good brother? Those are very specific topics. Our young men need classes where they're informed and taught about how to avoid the, the many dangers and temptations, especially of, of lust and, and sexuality in, this, in our culture today. They, they need those one-on-one -on -one classes. Families need care and attention. Married couples need their own, have, need, have teaching needs. Future teachers need to be equipped on how to teach, right? Teenagers, older saints, the list goes on. And you could probably were thinking a whole bunch of others that I didn't even list. The point is this, that when we think about all the needs in a local congregation, there is always a need for teachers to be involved in the work of equipping and educating and, and, and edifying the saints in order that they may be fully equipped for everything God has planned for them and God is expecting of them. And so every part is needed when it comes to the local work. So where are we going to get the teachers? Going back to Ephesians chapter 4 here. Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verses 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, speaking of Jesus, and he himself gave at some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Now I understand teachers is mentioned in verse 11, but so are prophets, apostles, evangelists, and pastors or elders. And where do you get teachers? It comes from first elders and preachers or evangelists doing their job to equip saints so they may become teachers, right? Just because you have a natural gift that may be talking in front of a crowd or teaching does not automatically mean you have all the skills necessary to, to be a teacher. I didn't. Still don't. <laughs> Working on that. Uh, we all are, right? 
but we see that God has given certain roles in the church to equip every saint in order to be to fulfill their ministry that God's given them. As we've quoted earlier, verse 15, one of the ways we come to maturity, one of the ways we continue to we become equipped and we know we are equipped is the ability to communicate God's word to somebody else. That verse 15, that's speaking that the truth in love, right? So where are we going to get the teachers? From us, right? Not every Christian will be a teacher, but every Christian should attempt to teach. Growing up with Guillermo's preaching, he was oftentimes would say this. Every Christian man, not necessarily will become a preacher, but every Christian man should be able to give a lesson. And the idea is you might be called upon in an emergency situation. You might be with a local work that doesn't have an evangelist. You might be in a situation where you should be able to at least have one lesson in your back pocket that you could present before God's people or a class you could teach in order to fulfill that need. Because God does not expect eloquence in teaching. He does expect earnestness, clarity, and correctness in teaching, right? If we were to judge by Paul's own teaching, his, his critics would say that he is wordy and, and goes too long and puts people to sleep, right? Like that young man in the third story window. But we wouldn't say Paul was a bad teacher, would we? His letters get quoted every Sunday. In fact, I'm reading a book right now called Effective Bible Teaching because it's an area that I am seeking to continue to grow in. And one of the things they point out there is when they wrote the first edition, the big debate in education was, are we student-centered or teacher-centered? That is, do students drive the education process or do teachers? And the book said they, they never liked that dichotomy. Current trends is learning-centered. That is, we're not judging the success of a class based on did the teacher communicate their lesson or did the students have questions, but did the students learn something? Which is the appropriate measure of any teaching situation. Did the students learn something? Did they learn the right things? Did they learn the truth of God and did they learn a way to apply it? Right? You know, in Haggai chapter 1, Speaking to this, uh, the, this need to at least make the attempt to teach. In the book of Haggai, the third to last minor prophet in our canon, Haggai is preaching to the generation of the return. So he's preaching during the roughly the same time period as Ezra and Nehemiah. In chapter 1, Verses 2 through 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai to the, pro the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses Why this house lies in waste? Now, point here to Haggai is that the people in that day were so busy making sure they were comfortable, they had neglected the temple of God and it was laying in ruins. And God's whole point is, is it time for you to live in luxury while the place of worship and service is in disrepair? Now, what does this have to do with teaching? It is easy to make excuses to try and say, well, somebody else will do it. I've never taught before. I'm not good at it. I'm too old. I'm too young. We, you can go down the list. I'm too busy, right? And I don't want to diminish that some of us are working a lot of hours each week. That's a reality, right? Some of us do have very demanding jobs. I'm not discounting that at all. But it's easy for us to make excuses. And sometimes when there's a need and we look around and say, well, who's going to fill the need? That person might be me. I'm not saying this to twist your arm, but I'm saying it to maybe get us to think about something. Maybe think about, maybe, maybe have I been making excuses? Have I been maybe avoiding getting involved in teaching in some capacity, not because 
I don't feel I'm equipped, but maybe I'm just making too many excuses. You know, God said in Isaiah 55 and verse 11 that his word does not go forth from him and not accomplish his purpose. So maybe you're concerned, I, I, I can't speak good. You know, sometimes you, maybe you might have chronic foot and mouth disease, as I often do. Know this, God's word can still be effective and powerful even when we maybe perhaps don't teach the lesson the best way we could. That's not an excuse for poor attempts, though, right? It's an encouragement that if you give your best effort, whatever that effort is, God can use it in the service of his people. Whatever that effort is. If it's the best you can do and you've given your heart and you've prepared, God honors that effort. And at this point, too, I want to just make it clear that we're not necessarily talking about Bible class at services or in the the Sunday school, although those are always needed. Teaching takes on different forms. Takes on the form of mentoring. Takes on the form of small group, right? Maybe it's a home study. Maybe it's just having lunch with somebody and you're, you're willing to offer some guidance and direction from the Word of God, right? There's, there's many different ways in which you can teach. But all Christians, if they, they confess, profess some level of maturity, teaching ought to be, is the marker of, one of the markers of maturity. So maybe you're thinking, well, what, where do I start? Where do I start? By the way, this is part one. We're going to be dealing with some more practical stuff next Sunday evening, Lord willing. So don't feel like I'm leaving you on the cliffhanger. Kind of am, but we're going to be finishing this next week. I want us to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at the description here of the man that God would have be a shepherd of his people. Looking here in verse 2, and then we're going to look at something about deacons as well. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, and note this, able to teach. Now, that does not mean able to teach something eventually. It means that if a man is going to serve as an office of shepherd, he needs to have a proven record of teaching the Word of God. Which means our shepherds here are proven teachers. So if you're maybe wondering, where do I start? Talk to the shepherds. I mean, I'm, not to put them on the spot, but let's just, let's just, let's just note this. One of our shepherds is a retired preacher. One of our shepherds is a retired educator in the in Tucson Unified School District. One of our shepherds has never preached full time, but has preached full time and done a lot of teaching and preaching. These men have a wealth of experience in teaching the Word of God. And they would love to mentor you, to give you pointers, to, help, to get you started down that path, right? And Kurt, Kurt's oftentimes point this out. There's no better way to start learning how to teach than being an assistant or co-teacher in one of the Sunday school classes. Because guess what? You don't have to do lesson planning. You just have to be there and, and, and take in the lesson, but also help and be part of that environment. In verse 9, in the same chapter, speaking about deacons, but they are to be holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. My understanding of that passage is that deacons are to have a firm understanding of what the Word of God teaches. They don't have the same qualifications as the elder does, that they need to have a proven track record of teaching. But I take by implication is these deacons should have an understanding of, of what the Word of God says. And if they are mature men, as I think deacons ought to be, they also should be teaching as Ephesians 4 and Hebrews chapter 5 would would include. So our deacons here, they kind of help make sure the Sunday school runs smoothly. Many of them have experience teaching. There are another great resource you can talk to, right? 
They, 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 would, they would love if you came to them and says, hey, I, I really want to get involved in teaching. I just don't know where to start. Can you help me? I think you would make our deacon's day if you, you came to them with that kind of question, right? Um, that's where a good resource is to begin. And then I want to note something here in Matthew 25 as we bring this to a close. Matthew chapter 25, briefly looking at the parable of the talents. Maybe not the way you think I'm going to use it, but let's, let's read this here. Verses 14 and 15. For it's just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and handed over his possessions to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and note this, each according to his own ability. In teaching, you are not expected to do more than what you're able to. But God has given us each a certain lot of talents to be used in his service according to what we're able to do. And I bring this up because maybe your skill set isn't the main teacher. First of all, you don't know until you try, so try, because you don't know until then. But maybe you find out in this process of trial and error that you really thrive as the co-teacher. You're really good at offering an additional comment and helping classroom management or just being a, being a Barnabas and being a supporter. Maybe that's where you really thrive. You don't know that until you try. And so, try. That's how you're... And it's twofold in this. Your elders probably have already seen some spiritual qualities in you that they might be able to point you in the right direction where they think you might best fit as your main teacher, secondary teacher, whatever. I'm using the Sunday school as an example, but they have a good read on you, right? Listen and seek their counsel. I think our deacons might also have some good read on you too about your, what your spiritual gifts and talents might be in that area. Secondly, I want us to note in verse 27 of this passage. Now, of course, the two and the five talent men immediately went to work and multiplied their talents. The one talent man hid it. And look in verse 27. The master says to him, Therefore you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would receive my money back with interest. What's the point here? The one talent man did absolutely nothing with what his master gave him. And the master was not expecting the one talent man to do what the five talent man did or the two talent man did. As I go back to what it said in verse 15, each according to his own ability. He gave him one talent, and he was expecting a one talent result. That is, according to his ability. So maybe you've never taught before. The elders, deacons, and God is not expecting you to have a master class level Bible class. They are expecting what a beginner teacher would do, right? Make the good-hearted attempt to teach. And they're there to offer you encouragement and feedback and how to improve. And, and you don't really start improving until you start doing it. You learn so much just by the act of, of teaching. And so if you're wondering where to start, talk to the elders, talk to the deacons. And ask yourself... Am I making a good return on the investment God's given to me? Yeah, you know, when, I, when I decided to go into preaching, one, I think my mom was a little shocked, but not really. From a young age, she knew I was going to teach something, right? I, I played school in the bedroom with my siblings and sit them down and I'd teach the lesson, right? Um, she knew I was going to teach something, right? That, that she saw something in me that I didn't until later. And I'll tell you this, your elders probably see something in you that maybe you're not seeing yourself. So ask them. And when we consider all the work that needs to get done in the local church, all the areas in which teaching is needed, the elders, deacons, and I can't do it all by ourselves, and nor are we sometimes the best fit for all those areas. You know, I like to, I am still young, and I like to think I can still relate to high school students and college students, but I know there's going to come a day 
There's going to come a day where I cannot relate. And I won't be the best fit for that age group teaching anymore. Likewise, I can't really relate to experiences of married life or parenting or, or, or being an older saint. But there will come a day where I am more equipped and a better fit for that age group. I'm saying that not to call it my failures, but to show that each congregation needs more than just one teacher. It has a need for several in order to make sure all the needs are, are being met by the best fit possible for that area. So next Sunday evening, Lord willing, I want to offer some basic principles on how do you, how do you teach a Bible class? How, what are the governing principles? I'm not going to necessarily give methods, but just those governing biblical principles of what makes good Bible teaching. And I, I, I hope, Lord willing, we'll be afforded that of, uh, opportunity to dig into it at that time. But the reason why God emphasizes so much teaching in his word is God chose not only to come as a man, but to come as a teacher, right? Jesus came as a, as a religious teacher to show us, to teach us one rightly what God desires of us and to show us the better way. And he expects his people that if we've accepted the teaching, we've become disciples as a specific kind of student, we've obeyed the gospel, we've obeyed the teaching, as Paul says in Romans 6, that we are saved from our sins when we submit to Christ in the waters of baptism. Part of being a disciple, part of being a Christian, then, is going out and, and teaching others the good news about Jesus. And maybe you're here tonight, you've already heard that good news. You know that Jesus died for your sins, was raised on the third day, and now he reigns in heaven as, as king over all. If, if you believe that, you're ready to confess that. Turn away from your sins and submit to your Lord and King in the waters of baptism. Risk your sins, we can assist you with that. Maybe you've done that in the past and you're struggling in sin. Or you need prayers of encouragement. We invite you to come forward. This is Kevin saying to sing the song that's been selected.